And uh, so here we have three uh, speakers lined up. Um, and the first speaker, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Madhvi Joshi. She is Joint Director of <coughs> Gujarat Biotechn uh, Biotechnology Research Center in the Department of Science and Technology. And what I can say is that, uh, mm, I mean, if she would have been not there, I would have not been uh, the <laughs> doing this COVID, uh, the WB, and we would have not been together a recon name in this field, if we are. Uh, so then uh, mm, the, I uh, am, thank you, uh, Madhubi, for uh, coming on short notice and waiting for your turn, uh, despite being very busy. Um, just some of the work is that, uh, yeah, um, she has been, I mean, uh, taking sequencing and is a, her, I think, uh, chapatis, <laughs> if I would say that uh, the, she, so much uh, the samples is being run and under her and so many patent also she has created and uh, she has extensively worked on a cross of uh, AMR uh, and polytry value chain in India. And uh, yeah, with this sort, uh, uh, the introduction, Madhvi floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manish, for uh, having me in this conference and uh, giving me the opportunity to interact with the young brains working in the area of environmental science. So, of course, my presentation is little out of the box, I would say, because uh, GBRC is core strength. Uh, so, first of all, I come from Gujarat Biotechnology Research Center, which is an autonomous institute under Department of Science and Technology, Government of Gujarat. And uh, the core strength of the center is into genomics and bioinformatics. So we have been working in almost all area of uh, biotechnology through the approach of genomics and uh, metaomics. And, uh, but looking at the conference requirement, and of course, uh, Dr. Manish had steeled my topic, <laughs> I, I would be presenting uh, uh, the work here on uh, development of multi-omics based treatment technologies for textile waste. So I think most of you would be knowing the issue of the textile waste, uh, which is specifically prevalent in a state like Gujarat, where a lot of um, work is being actually undertaken in the textile. And it is, uh, you know, Ahmedabad is called the Manchester um, of the Western uh, centers and uh, Jaipur also being one of the industrial hub. Kutch, of course, is very uh, famous for all uh, the textile related work. And uh, as we know, you know, that with the industrialization, it brings in its own challenges as also I could understand from the contaminant session that you people were discussing about. So uh, uh, with that, actually, uh, Jetpur, I think, is uh, the world famous example where, uh, you know, the industry uh, pollution from the textile has contaminated groundwaters to that great an extent that, uh, you know, even the drinking water there is coming out is uh, red in color. And uh, with this, actually, you know, uh, what we understood is that uh, there are major issues lying with the dyes which are getting into the system, but somehow not uh, getting, um, just a second, I will try to change it to the pointer options. So, so uh, basically, we have taken the main groups of dyes as uh, anthraquinone, azo dyes, sulfur dyes, and the wet dyes. And uh, what we have tried to uh, learn in a metaomics approach is that we all know that these dyes are very difficult to metabolize by various treatment options which are available. And based on that, uh, there is a lot of uh, environmental threat on um, toxicity and uh, to the aquatic life. And ultimately they are also mutagenic to humans. And uh, when they are coming together as a um, decolorized state, which is another challenge in detecting them. So here, what we have tried done through this project is we have taken the wastewater treatment plant samples from uh, Jetpur, uh, industrial uh, site ETP, effluent treatment plant and the CETP, also at uh, the Watwa and Ahmedabad. And we have tried characterize uh, the textile effluent in total. 
uh, in terms of their compounds and their physicochemical characterizations. And what we found out on the basis of that is that the major problem is the azo dyes being converted into the amines, you know, during certain uh, treatments which are being done. And uh, the analysis which was done, which also proved that these amines are present, which are not only toxic, but they are also carcinogenic. So the approach that we have taken is that it was a multi-omics approach. So in the first approach, what we have done is we have done the DNA isolation of all uh, the sampling points and tried to run the metagenomic sequencing. Parallelly, we have also isolated microbes from um, the same effluent and screen them for their potential for the dye degradation. Uh, from the metagenomic samples, we have done the taxonomic and the functional analysis parts, wherein we have found important genes which are responsible for the dye degradation in the metagenome. And uh, from the potential dye degraders, we again try to correlate that which are the organisms which are harboring this capacity as a total in the ETBs. And then the future plan is to do the cloning and expression of this purified potential enzymes uh, for its technology development at a large scale uh, implementation and efficient removal of these SO dyes from the contaminants. So as you can see that uh, these are the sample cores that we have collected six samples uh, with the synthetic dyes which were there. Uh, that is TD1 is a uh, um, active G yellow, then active red, muhizol yellow, magenta, blue, and black. Uh, as you can see, this is the process of uh, the CETP plant, and we have collected samples at the outlet in the collection tank, in the primary flocculator, sludge disposer, uh, to the final outlet and the final sludge disposal sites, and uh, we found, so this is the sampling site, as you can see. And we also did screening of the microbes as well as isolation of DNA and uh, uh, their uh, potential ability to uh, decolorize the dye. When we characterize this uh, effluent, uh, as you can see that these are highlighted in the red, which were a couple of compounds which were found out to be a byproduct of the azo dye degradation, as well as those are, uh, you know, carcinogenic to the environment. So uh, with that, actually, we also did isolation of the potential cultures. So as you can see that we have taken several dyes. This is TD1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 and different microbes. And as you can see, the decolorization pattern, which has been observed. Now, some of the potential strain, which we found out from this is uh, listed over here in bacteria and Pseudomonas aeruginosa was one of the very important uh, degrader as we can see. And then the fungal isolates also, we could found out some of the microalgae, which were responsible uh, for that. As you can see that some of the top species that we found out based on the metagenomics approach of uh, the CETP plant. So some of the organisms were found to be common, which were predominant in the metagenome as well as the culturable approach. So the next approach that we did is uh, the comparison of the metagenomics and the whole genomics, which is uh, more or less uh, the functional genomics part. Wherein, as you can see, that we focused on some of the pathways which are present in our transcriptome, uh, sorry, uh, the metagenome, that is the benzoate degradation, the phenylalanine metabolism, polyaromatic degradation, and uh, biphenyl degradation. So, as you can see, that the various pathways which were present from the different samples which were collected uh, in our sampling site. Now, again, we tried to understand that these enzymatic systems which are reflected in the metagenomic analysis are attributes of which cultures. So a couple of cultures I have shown here as a representative image. For example, this is an enterobacter cloacea and this is an benzoate degradation pathway. So what we have done is, you know, the culture of enterobacter cloacea, which was showing the potential degradation of these azo dyes, 
we have done the whole genome sequencing of that and we have identified that these are the genes which are attributed or which are present in the pathway. Similarly, in the bacillus like any formis. So I'm just showing some of the representative images over here because looking at the 10 minutes time slot given to me it will not be possible to cover the crux. So uh, as you can see that in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we found out the systems which are responsible for uh, the degradation of these dyes. Similarly, in the bacillus subtilis through the whole genome. And these are a couple of enzymes we, which we could identify, which would have, uh, and these are the copy numbers found in the genome, which were responsible for the dye decolorization. So uh, the total approach, which was taken as a metagenomic as well as the culturable route, we also tried to formulate in metagenome, what are the other organisms predominantly present and they are expressing their traits, which we could bin. So ultimately, uh, binning is basically an approach of assembling genomes from the metagenome. And uh, what we could identify is that 79 potential beans which we could identify from uh, the samples which were uh, done in these metagenome. And out of that 79, 76 uh, were the bacterial genomes which we could complete and three were the archaeal genomes. So uh, this binning approach has led to a construction of the genomes of an unculturable uh, species in uh, the metagenomic approach. And as you can see that some of them, they, we have listed over here that, that we could identify as a Vibrio and uh, Bacteriodales or maybe, you know, Choreobacteria or uh, Clostridales officially. So these are the cultures that we identified. Now going step further, you know, we wanted to again compare. So the initial approach was understanding the metagenomics of the ETP and from there deriving significant or the predominant cultures, growing them in the lab and understanding their genome. Now we really wanted to understand their role in the dye degradation. And for that, we have done a transcriptome analysis and in that transcriptome analysis, what we did is that uh, there were uh, 250 ml volume flasks which were taken with the different dyes, as you can see, and we had inoculated the controls in that. And 1% bacterial inoculum was taken and the transcriptome analysis of day one and day six was performed. And uh, what we found out ultimately is, you know, the top 25, 50 or the 100 genes with uh, the RPKM value uh, compared to the control sample. So of course, control was only a culture uh, with the minimal salt medium. We compared the uh, genes which were present at a two-fold, log-fold two or log-fold four change with the p-value 0.05 and 0.01 between one, the day one and day six. And the major focus was done on the pathways which are responsible for dye degradation, specifically benzoate degradation and sulfur metabolism. So as you can see that uh, these are the different dyes. And as you can see that compared to the control, uh, how many are the upregulated and the downregulated genes on day one vis-a-vis -vis day six. So there was a significant uh, change that we observed and uh, we identified some of the genes which are uh, upregulated and downregulated in this and they are responsible for example, you know, uh, some of the quorum sensing genes, biofilm formation genes and uh, some related to the degradation genes and uh, as well as metabolism genes. So again, as you can see, uh, this is the volcano plot of uh, the representative volcano plot of the log two fold change in uh, expression or at uh, the p value 0 0.05 uh, in day one versus day six. And as you can see, that there are significant clusters of genes, as we can see, that uh, coming into the red zone, which were uh, upregulated and downregulated. So ultimately, we created a Venn diagram showing the number of upregulated transcripts in the each transcriptome 
reduced in response to each dyes. And these are the different dyes over here on day one and day six. And ultimately we could observe, you know, the clusters of genes which are dye specific, um, which is present in uh, our organism. And this is very surprising, you know, so mostly the pathways which are taken by this are very difficult, different than that of uh, in response to different dye decolorization. Uh, okay, I'm, yeah, conclusion. So of course I know, and I have just reached to the conclusion that uh, uh, so the ultimate objective in this project is to deploy the metaomics approach, and using that metaomics approach, we want to actually uh, finally you know get out with some of the potential enzymes which we would validate at the laboratory scale and uh, take them into the field uh, for uh, further work. Of course, this project is still ongoing and. Yeah, and we have you some of them will be doing the validation of yeah. these genes and uh, other work to reach to the conclusion. So many thanks. I would just cut short my presentation over here and over to Dr. Manish. Thank you, Madhavi. Uh, actually, um, just uh, stay tu tuned. Uh, just we will take uh, another two panelists quickly and then we will uh, move to panel discussion. Uh, so the, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Kisor Acharya. Uh, he has uh, done PhD from Newcastle University. So he is representing uh, the co-organizing institute. And he has been very, very instrumental in uh, running this project. So first of all, I would like to thank him for being the, uh, the very good collaborator uh, who came to India twice and uh, under this project and then he um, run the show, show for us. And again, in this conference, he will be presenting uh, twice, actually. Uh, he told that, uh, uh, see, don't, don't ask me three times, but uh, he has been such an integral part of this course, uh, this uh, entire project. Uh, he has developed a novel portable method to identify pathogens in water in near, uh, real time. And uh, about that method, he is going to talk tomorrow in the first, uh, um, in the uh, first theme from 4.30. And uh, he has uh, the, got several projects, including the Global Challenge Academy Award, uh, UK, uh, UKRI, GCRF, Water Security and Sustainable Development, Hub Rapid Response Award. And uh, he is having a um, visa, or you can say that the, as a uh, potential, uh, I mean, the it is a young mind or the creative mind, or I, I don't forget, I, maybe Kisor can tell. Uh, so Kisor, uh, I'm sorry to make you wait, and I hope that, uh, that you will finish it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Manish for, for providing me uh, this opportunity to present uh, uh, some of my work. Uh, the work that I'm going to present today uh, uh, this has been in principally accepted for publication in uh, uh, Nature Partner Journal, Clean Water, uh, which should be out uh, shortly. So, uh, so this is the work that we we did in in Nepal uh, using the the suitcase la uh, suitcase lab uh, that uh, uh, we developed uh, uh, in Newcastle University. So, so this is actually like how we can apply the apply sequencing data for for microbial source tracking. So I'm going to talk uh, for another 10 minutes uh, on the outcome we, we got from that project. So the topic is fecal pollution source tracking in the Holy Bagmati River by portable 16S rRNA sequencing. Oh, I'm not able to go to the next slide. Uh -huh. uh, this is PDF or PowerPoint? No, this is PowerPoint. Then why? Probably you'll have you'll have to you know click on uh, the screen first and then go next. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, it works. Okay, so let me provide a, a brief context uh, before thank I you, go to the, the research outcome. So Bagmati uh, is a principal uh, river of Bagmati River basin and one of the the major basins of Nepal. Uh, this river basin is mainly fed by 
natural spring and, and monsoon rainfall and is considered a source of Nepalese civilization and urbanization. The river flows uh, along the famous Paspati Nath temple located in Kathmandu Valley, the capital city of Nepal, and holds great religious value for Hindu. And every day, hundreds and thousands of Hindu pilgrims, they perform uh, bathing activities as a religious ritual in the, in the Bhagwati River. So, uh, so water from uh, the upstream part of the river is, is used for drinking, irrigation, livestock, industrial and domestic uh, uh, purposes by people of Kathmandu Valley. Every day about uh, 30 million liters of water is sourced from the river and its tributaries for domestic purposes. Like many rivers in big cities, especially in developing countries, the Bagmati River is also polluted. And uh, the pollution is uh, the result of rapid urbanization, population growth, unmanaged sewage connection from domestic, industrial, and agricultural effluent, solid waste disposal along the river bank. And uh, such pollution is quite visible in, in midstream and downstream part of the river. So uh, the, the pollution of Bagmati River has not only affected the aesthetic value, but also caused high microbial and chemical loads, posing a considerable threat to public health and ecosystem. So robust and uh, frequent screening of uh, river water microbiomes is essential to get an insight uh, into fecal contamination sources and the pathway of waterborne uh, disease transmission, which can ultimately help in designing effective intervention for uh, safeguarding public and aquatic ecosystem health. And microbial source tracking methods, especially that employs qPCR, uh, which, is, uh, which is also called like quantitative polymerase chain reaction and next generation sequencing techniques. These techniques has been increasingly used to identify the sources of fecal contamination in, in different kinds of water source. So next generation sequencing can be used to screen uh, any kind of sample to get an overview of the microbial composition of, of, of samples while qPCR can be used to confirm the presence of specific bacteria or any, any kind of traits of interest. So in order to better understand the microbial water quality of Bagmati River and influence from unplanned urbanization, population growth, unmanaged sewage connection, solid waste disposal along the river bank, we, we surveyed uh, the microbiome of, uh, of Bagmati. Let me interruption. So we, we surveyed uh, uh, Bagmati River from different reaches uh, of the river at two different seasons, monsoon and the post monsoon season. Uh, and this sampling was conducted last year uh, in 2019. Uh, so three of the sampling sites we selected, uh, uh, which, were, which are S1, S1, S2, and S3, uh, somewhere around here. These are uh, the, the site upstream of the Pospodinath temple, while the other, other three sites, S4, S5 and S6, uh, they were downstream of the temple. Uh, S1 is the, S1 is the, the site from where uh, the river emerges and, and we can consider this as a baseline. Whereas S6 is the, is the site where the river leaves the city. So this site here. Uh, so in addition to uh, river water sample, we also sample untreated sewage. Uh, uh, normally in Kathmandu, like all these sewage, they are directly discharged into the river without any treatment. So one of our sample was untreated sewage. And then we also sample treated uh, wastewater effluent. Uh, uh, and then normally all these treated uh, uh, wastewater effluent, they are normally discharged into the river. So the collected samples uh, were filtered. Uh, we extracted DNA from those samples. Uh, for downstream analysis, we performed 16S RRA amplicon sequencing uh, using our suitcase lab, uh, where uh, amine ion is like an integral part. Uh, in addition, we also quantified some of the marker genes for fecal indicator bacteria and, and some, some pathogens such as Arcobacter and Vibrio cholera. And then finally, uh, to better understand the source of fecal contamination and their relative contribution, we perform microbial source tracking using uh, source tracker analysis. So in this study, we used uh, source river 
that is the sample from site one, and then untreated sewage, and then treated sewage as a potential sources, whereas uh, the sample from site two, three, four, five, and six, they were considered as a sink. And source tracker analysis estimated the relative contribution of microbial communities from different sources to the sink. So here is the outcome. The key finding of uh, source tracker analysis shows that in post monsoon season, uh, especially if you see here in post monsoon season, uh, the water flowing in the downstream of the Pospatinath temple, uh, the Bagmati river has mostly the characteristic of untreated sewage, discharged directly into the river. Uh, the microbial community in location S6, so location S6, if you remember in the map, so that is the site where the river leaves the city were mostly dominated by sequence from the untreated sewage, which is approximately about 80% and uh, very less extent by uh, river upstream and treated effluent. So in principle, what this means is, regardless of the season, at the point where the river leaves the city, river becomes like an open sewer. Uh, so this is another analysis we did. So this plot is a volcano plot, uh, which compares the abundance of uh, human gut genera and putative human pathogenic genera detected in site one versus site six. So the abundance of majority of the human gut genera and putative human pathogenic genera were significantly higher at site, site six as compared to site one. The bacteria genera such as Acetoborax, Geobacillus, Legionella, they were predominated in upstream site, while genera containing uh, human uh, putative pathogens and got bacteria such as Clostridium, Bibotella, Arcobacter, Lactobacillus, Enterococcus, Streptococcus, they became more prominent in downstream sites and their abundance were comparable to what we observed in, in wastewater uh, influent or like untreated sewage. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the outcome from uh, QPCI, uh, where we all quantified some of the fecal indicator marker genes and marker for uh, pathogenic bacteria. As expected, all the pathogens and marker genes were detected uh, in the three sites downstream of Pospatina Temple uh, in both sampling events. And the concentration of genes, uh, of these genes in these three sites were significantly higher than in, in upstream sites uh, and wastewater effluent. And uh, the, the gene abundance were comparable to what we observed in uh, uh, the untreated sewage. So the take home message, so regardless of the season, uh, fecal and uh, putative pathogenic bacterial load in Bagmati River increased as the river flows downstream. Source tracker analysis revealed that the most significant portion of water flowing in downstream part of the Bagmati River is mostly contributed by untreated sewage discharge and adequate wastewater treatment facilities and safe fecal sludge management system are therefore essential for protecting public health in Kathmandu Valley because their absence turns uh, Urban River into, into open sewer that will pose significant exposure risks to the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kisor, um, for to the point and of course, showing the study from uh, a um, place uh, from Asia country, and of course, uh, the, this Bagmati River also comes across to my town. Uh, so this is really important. Uh, now, the last speaker for this uh, theme uh, is uh, Dr. Sanjeev Mahapatra. Uh, he is a very fresh graduate, and now I, the, doing postdoc. And I, uh, the uh, he was um, doing at uh, he is doing postdoc at uh, National University of Singapore. Uh, which is one of the top in the world. Um, the, he had uh, been a very bright student and uh, a scholar of IIT Bombay, uh, where he got uh, many Wari uh, fellowship and they spent six months in, uh, in the US. And there I, he has spent that six months with uh, me in the same lab. Then he went to David Werner and he is a kind of connecting link who, uh, is, uh, <laughs> who told me about this uh, Professor called Bernard. <laughs> so then, uh, so he was uh, rightly, and he he himself is he has a lot of good work uh, to his credit. So 
uh, Sanjeev, um, maybe seven minutes. Of course, he wanted to uh, be in emerging contaminant team, but uh, somehow we forced him to be in this, but I know he is going to justify it. Sanjeev. Yeah, thank you, Professor Manish Kumar, for the warm welcome. Uh, let me share my screen now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically I'm in the microbial quality uh, theme. So I try to mold my work in that way so that I can justify to the theme. So, so I have kept the title of my presentation today, the journey of E. coli development and the corresponding development of multi-drug resistance. So before come, going to that, let me uh, first talk about uh, what is water distribution network. So around 2.2 billion people uh, around the world do not have access to safely managed drinking water services. And India is among many developed countries where access to uh, safe 24 by 7 water supply is still rare. Uh, the provision uh, of safe, reliable, as well as affordable water supply through efficient water management arrangement is crucial goal for the water supply sectors. Uh, it is uh, increasingly uh, acknowledged that these objectives are difficult to achieve um, through conventional water supply networks uh, without targeting uh, established, uh, without targeting the continuous water supply, which is operated on the pressurized system. Basically, the basic difference between intermittent and uh, continuous water supply is nothing but uh, in the continuous, we have a 24 by 7 water supply, whereas in the intermittent supply, we have only two to four hours of water supply. So during non-pressure uh, uh, duration, which, is, uh, which lasts for like 20 hours, so due to buildup of negative pressure, contaminants through the leaky joints can enter and subsequently it can damage the water distribution network. Uh, not only it just affect the water distribution network, it can glitch to the formation of biofilms. Uh, and these biofilms in drinking water pipe network can be responsible for a wide range of water quality and operational problems. So basically biof biofilms can be responsible for the loss of disinfectant residuals, increased bacterial levels, reduction of dissolved oxygen, taste and order issues, and of course, red or black water problems due to iron and sulfate reducing bacteria. Um, so, uh, so in order to assess uh, the uh, uh, water distribution network in the study area, I mean, this particular study was conducted in collaboration with the NIRI. And uh, in this particular study area, as you can see here uh, 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 in the figure, uh, the, you know, in the, most of the dead ends, uh, the residual chlorine is quite low. I mean, it's a very much, uh, it's not at all safe for the consumption. Uh, so from this study, uh, what we identify is low pressure, high water rates, as well as intersupply are the major concern in the network. And uh, for continuous supply more, the water rates in the network was 48 hours, for, but for the intermittent supply, we found it around three, three uh, days. So as you can see here, uh, these are the leakage points and uh, some places where I have collected the sample. Uh, those samples are collected like early in the winter and it's very cold uh, and the water was supplied only in the morning, five to six o'clock, five to seven o'clock. So, and later on when these uh, and the samples were subjected to microbial analysis, we could identify, I mean, there were several issues with the microbial water quality as well. Uh, the findings of the study was conveyed to the municipality and uh, subsequently, uh, uh, old pipes were replaced and adequate precautions were taken to improve the water quality. Uh, so basically, when we talk about microbial water quality, uh, there are currently quite a few different types of drinking water quality standards being used in many individual countries. Uh, the three are uh, most commonly suggested as global standard include US EPA, one is from the European Union, and another is a WHO standard. So the WHO standard is also used in uh, Singapore, uh, where currently I'm pursuing my higher study. Uh, so coming back to the next slide, uh, as you can see here, according to the United Nations, by 2025, around 1.8 billion people will be living in countries with absolute water scarcity and two third of the world population 
would be on the deficit of water condition. Of course, uh, say uh, climate change, population growth, and urban uh, urbanization are the one to be blamed. Uh, so at this particular scenario, it becomes utmost priority to save each drop of water, especially in island countries like Singapore. Uh, so uh, there are currently quite uh, 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 many sources for the Singapore to withdraw water. And uh, Singapore is a nation without groundwater and its source of water mainly depend on the four factors like the desalination of seawater, new water, which is nothing but the recycled water, the reservoir water and water supply from other countries such as Malaysia. Uh, currently, with respect to microbial water quality, uh, Singapore water is quite safe, but when it comes to the other, other water quality aspects, so there are a certain concern. So for example, uh, uh, Singapore uh, being an island, uh, it provides an excellent platform for the aquaculture. As you can see in the figure, uh, uh, yeah, so in the figure, you can see uh, that the dotted points are nothing but the aquaculture facilities around Singapore. So in those aquaculture facilities, there's a heavy use of antibiotics and uh, which is a bigger concern uh, in Singapore because it may lead to the development of antimicrobial resistance. So this particular study was conducted uh, by our research group in Singapore. Uh, so the study actually identified that uh, of the 33 multi-drug multi uh, resistant E. coli isolated from the surface water of this particular uh, around Singapore, around 82% were extended uh, spectrum beta-lactamase producers. So basically this ESBS can be resistant to a range of frequently used antibiotics, including penicillin as well as cephalosporins. As a result of infection caused by this bacteria can be difficult to treat and the prevalence of this bacteria and infection caused by them are becoming more common to both community as well as healthcare settings. Um, as you all know, antimicrobial resistance and more uh, specifically antibiotic resistance has become a major threat to our society. Resistance continue to grow because of improper uh, prescription and antimicrobial uh, uh, uses as a result of which antibiotics are also detected in the surface water, wastewater. So in this particular study, I mean, as we know, like uh, antibiotics are present at a very low concentration. Uh, it's required uh, a very much, uh, I mean, a very robust uh, method to expensive LCMS technique. And uh, because they are present at a very low concentration nanogram per liter, it requires use of a certain kind of isotopes for their uh, uh, quantification purpose. Uh, as you can see here, with the use of different kind of uh, uh, isotopes, uh, the recovery of various pharmaceuticals like various uh, antibiotics has been significantly improved. Uh, here I'm showing for nafloxacin, ciprofloxacin, and levofloxacin. And uh, yeah, so this particular technique has been widely used across the globe for the detection of antibiotics around the world. So, uh, uh, so when we discuss about the history about the antibiotics, uh, so but, uh, beta lactams are a wide range of antibiotics uh, and the first of which to discover was penicillin by Alexander Fleming uh, in the year 1928. And most of these beta lactam antibiotics contain a, contain a beta lactam ring and they include penicillin such as amoxicillin as well as cephalosporin. Uh, a well-known mechanism of antimicrobial resistance in bacteria particularly beta-lactam antibiotics is by the secretion of beta-lactam uh, hydrolyzing enzyme called beta-lactam anti uh, uh, beta-lactamase and similar so actually to... uh, uh, the point is here we can be uh, really less specific and just uh, the overview uh, that yeah. Uh, the yeah so basically uh, similar enzymes can be produced by different uh, yes. microorganisms by using this particular concept of antibiotic resistance we have developed this sensor and uh, this paper will be i mean already on, on the verge of acceptance so we uh, through this sensor uh, we are trying to detect several antibiotics of the class of uh, cephalosporins as i have highlighted here and uh, this is, I mean, uh, this can actually going to replace uh, LCMS technique. And this sensor can be utilized uh, for the detection of antibiotics, uh, not in just the environmental sample, but also in the food as well as uh, in the milk, uh, in the milk product as well. 
so in a not cell but i would like to conclude here along with microbial water quality it is also essential to monitor antibiotics and antibiotic resistant gene in different environmental components including drinking water to safeguard the public health as a uh, part of this collaboration uh, at gandhinagar and newcastle we have also did some work in uh, uh, ahmedabad where antibacterial resistance uh, genes as well as uh, several groups of pharmaceuticals has been identified so uh, so does not does not just e coli uh, i think resistant e coli are also going to be the major threat to this generation Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you Sanjeev. Of course, we are running ten minutes late, but I. Uh, the, so what I will do is that once you will uh, stop uh, the your presentation, we have seen your nice picture. So uh, then, uh, Madhvi, are you there? So I think uh, Kisor uh, and Sanjeev, I can ask them uh, or request them. Uh, that to stay and take the question with uh, the next session, but uh, if you are available, otherwise we will uh, just have uh, one or two questions and then go. go Can we just have quick questions? Yeah. yeah. So um, if there is a uh, the I mean the first two question is uh, on my uh, page is that microbiological contamination has never got such kind of uh, attention, uh, which. uh the this uh, covid 19 uh, era many times i i ask my student that whether you want to die from arsenic or malaria or the water borne disease or something uh, they choose arsenic but when i say that the if biological microbiological contaminant if not treated can kill you very quick then the arsenic which can takes years to kill you so uh, i want to understand uh, from your perspective that uh, what is the extent length and uh, the uh, Uh, i mean approach that needs to be done and where do you think that somehow microbial contamination of the water e was lagging even if being uh, the very important and uh, also that what kind of research come or uh, monitoring and those aspects are there so madhuri so, so as it is rightly pointed out you know to be dying from a covid or maybe you know coming from a polluted water or the arsenic you replied yourself that the one is a slow death the other one is immediate right if you have to die so uh, you cannot ignore the microbial contamination in groundwater the microbial contamination present in uh, the rivers currently which is there and we need to develop long term plans to combat them and overcome them so uh, according to uh, you know the current needs as we are paying attention to the geogenic contaminants and the contaminants from other resources we'll also have to have the significant plan as uh, i think kishore also mentioned in his talk that you know some of the quick chip assays or uh, the rapid on site detection kits for the the emerging microbial contaminants in various resources uh, including uh, river so those type of the research activities we need to do uh, the lateral flow assays uh, specifically nalfia and other which is a nucleic acid lateral flow assay where you know you can also test uh, the amr work which is presented by sanjeev you can uh, so these are some of the uh, you know the futuristic research should be undertaken by the the young researchers when it comes to detection of uh, microbial contaminants so yes to answer your question we need to have a strategic action plan for detecting uh, microbial contaminants and we also need to have the the smart approaches to detect them on site and make them available yeah so two cents from kisor what do you think is that this uh, the microbial pollution of the river and surface waters are uh, how much critical do you think it is in the context of uh, uk and indian if you can give some comparative views that we have i mean we need to we all know that water is our life so we need we need to the water that we drink need to be safe the water is all is only safe if it's free from pathogen and contamination so uh, i think uh, this water pollution um, for me is more critical than this covid issue uh, uh the actually he is a very diplomatic uh, guy that's why i want to but i will dig uh, to take something really out uh, because 
uh, the, this is really a good statement, and I can uh, I have noted it down. That uh, the but my uh, point was that uh, the how the surface water quality uh, problem is going to affect uh, the developing world, and uh, of course you have told that this is our life and like that. Um, so I mean, and so you you have been part of very rapid response grant. So if you are asked to develop or some of the uh, very urgent issues, because now the in the next uh, speaker who are already coming, uh, already logged in, are from UNICEF, from the Gujarat Pollution Control Board. Madhvi itself is uh, from a government organization. I mean, uh, so what could be the some very burning issues that we should take? Well, uh, this kind of rapid technology help us to understand the problem quickly. I mean, we can only come up with solution if we know the problem. So uh, uh, the data that we generate uh, will definitely help in, in, in policy making, I mean, decision making. So uh, like even if we are uh, planning to come up with uh, intervention to treat water or like something similar, then uh, um, rapid monitoring or getting data quickly is quite important. And, and like, for instance, if we are planning to use uh, like a river water or, or even a groundwater for for like to process for drinking purpose of, or for even for agricultural uh, activities, we need to make sure that water we are using is safe. So, I mean, it's quite critical. Uh, we understand uh, the quality of the water that we are using. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the one of the important point is that consistent monitoring and uh, rapid testing. Um, the Sanjeev, uh, the just, uh, this is the last question of this theme. Um, ARB antibiotic resistant genes or bacteria, these are the uh, a kind of uh, second, um, I would say that not direct uh, impact, but the secondary impacts. Uh, so there were several questions about this antibiotic resistant genes. Can it be transmitted through the food or can it be, I mean, the how uh, it can affect human uh, more precisely? Of course, your method is going to be a good way and it deserves to be published. And uh, I, my advanced congratulations to you, but uh, what is your take on that? Well, actually, uh, the study that I presented over here from the Singapore, uh, most of these antibiotic resistance genes they have identified in the aquaculture facility. So uh, similar studies are available where they have found this uh, antibiotic resistance gene, not only from the aquaculture facility, but rather from the many uh, animal farming facility, even uh, chick, uh, like the chicken farming as well as uh, uh, milk uh, products. So definitely we are going to get through the uh, food, of course. I mean, that's why there are a lot of studies around uh, all this aquaculture facility and uh, swine uh, facilities uh, where animal farming is going on to reduce the burden of those uh, antibiotics uses as well as their uh, byproduct uh, antibiotic resistant gene. So Actually, Madhvi is... has uh, working on this uh, ARB also on the poultry farms. But mm -hmm. I want to understand that, okay, antibiotic resistant uh, gene has developed in the uh, poultry or in the animal. How it will incorporate it into us? So I tell you one thing, you know, usually when you are uh, talking about the transmission of ARB genes from the food sources to humans, the first of all, what is important is, you know, the maintenance of hygiene. Yeah, if uh, naturally when, you know, you have a poultry, you do not consume the parts which are harboring ARBs, which is, you know, the intestine and the other parts. But if, you know, somehow they are not handled properly at the site or during transport or during processing, and those are getting uh, co-harbored along with the products, like maybe, you know, the egg... Uh, shell skins or maybe you know on the meat and if you are not consuming them with the proper cooking uh, processes then there are chances that they will get transmitted you know uh, uh, in in your gut but of course to monitor them is a long-term process because when you are talking about antimicrobial resistant genes getting uh, you know incorporated in your system then it also comes from various other sources it is not only limited to the food, to the water, to the environment, so many other things. And uh, you can visualize their incorporation in the intestinal microflora over a period of time. It, it would not be that directly attributed. Yeah, that is uh, the 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, the, there are some of the, what uh, is last two days we have been seeing that uh, even if we work in the area, um, all of researcher knows uh, that uh, they, they don't wrongly want to promote and uh, in many cases they want to prove it first and they try to, and same aspect I'm seeing. I so, so that a, is what, the, no, so that is what I would just like to interrupt you here for a second and uh, bring you that in One Health Poultry Hub, which is being funded by UKRI under Global Challenge Research Fund, we are trying to understand the poultry distribution networks with reference to AMR. And there yeah. we would be, you know, looking at uh, the transmission of AMR in the poultry value chain. And probably, you know, at the end of that, I will be able to give you a more concrete answer. Yeah. So actually here I will take on uh, my co-convener uh, on uh, the, I mean, uh, David, he also worked on this uh, aspect. So just your final line, David, you want to add to this discussion? Uh, welcome <coughs> or, or thanks uh, for allowing me to briefly say hi to everyone. Uh, I had to teach, that's why I'm late. Uh, I mean, what we find is that AMR bacteria mainly come from untreated sewage in the environment. And uh, that kind of says that the, the highest risk is still from people, people using antibiotics. And then, you know, the gut bacteria become resistant because people use antibiotics. But at the same time, it's just a concern if, if, if you see these bacteria also in the environment and it just points towards the need of treating wastewater. That, that's my main message, you know, treat the wastewater before you discharge it. And then a whole range of problems will go away from AMR to pathogens to nutrients and so forth. Yeah, thank you, David. With this, uh, I would like to conclude this session and thank uh, all the speakers. And we will, uh, of course, uh, sending you some of the uh, token of appreciation. Thank you very much for coming. Thank um, you. And yeah.